Hey everyone! In this video, we're going to be talking about the contradictions between the Book of Mormon and the Bible. And there are so many, but this list that I'm going to read from just contains 10. So I'm going to keep it short. And I think these 10 are enough to show that there is a completely different message taught. There are so many contradictions, and I think that it would be great if you would jump into this subject further and do some research for yourself, but I'm going to point out 10 today. And I got the info in this video from the Institute of Religious Research. They have a whole section of their website. It's Mormons in Transition, and it's all completely sourced. Um, this particular part was a uh, put together and written by Luke P. Wilson. I want to give him the credit, but it is excellent. So I wanted to share it on my channel. I thought it was very informative and a very important subject to cover. So let's start. Um, the first contradiction, the Book of Mormon teaches that little children are not capable of sin because they do not have a sinful nature. We'll find this in Moroni 8.8. 8. I'm just going to read it. Little children are whole. For they are not capable of committing sin. Wherefore, the curse of Adam is taken from them in me, that it hath no power over them. And the law of circumcision is done away in me. So it literally says, little children are whole, for they are not capable of committing sin. This one hits home for me. I am a mother of a five, three, and one-year-old, all of whom are absolutely capable of committing sin. <laughs> Um, I love them and they're kids. And this does not by any means say my position on this and the biblical position on this does not at all imply that um, those who die in infancy or very small children are lost or damned to hell. Not at all. On the contrary, you'll find that David, when his baby died, says um, specifically, I will see him again one day. And um, anyway, there's that's another subject. But I have to say that little children are absolutely capable of sin. They are born with a sin nature. And we see this in Psalm 51 verse 5, where it clearly teaches that we have a sinful nature from birth, saying, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So from conception on, we have a sin nature. And that is the sin nature that condemns us to death. And the only way that we come out of this deadness in our sin is to be made alive in and through the work of Christ. So moving on, the second contradiction, the Book of Mormon teaches that the disobedience of Adam and Eve in eating the forbidden fruit was necessary so that they could have children and bring joy to mankind. So this is an interesting one. The Adam and Eve disobeying was absolutely necessary. And for what reason? So that they could have children and bring joy to mankind. You'll find this in 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. In contrast to this, the Bible specifically declares that Adam's transgression was a sinful act of rebellion that unleashed the power of sin and death in the human heart and throughout God's perfect world. Genesis 3, 16 through 19 uh, talks about this. Romans 5, 12 and Romans 8, 20 through 21 are all excellent references um, on regards to this topic. There is no biblical support for the view that Adam and Eve could only fulfill the command to be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1, 28, by disobeying God's command regarding the forbidden fruit, Genesis 2, 17. The Book of Mormon teaching that these divine commands are contradictory and that God expected Adam and Eve to figure out that in reality he wanted them to break the latter command of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, in order to keep the former, be fruitful and multiply, has no basis in logic or the biblical text um, and attributes equivocation to God. So I want to move on to point number three. The Book of Mormon teaches that black skin is a sign of God's curse. So that white-skinned people are considered morally and spiritually superior to black-skinned people. 2 Nephi 5.21 
In contrast, the Bible teaches that God made of one blood all nations of men. You'll find this in Acts 17, 26, of one blood God made all nations of men. That in Christ, distinctions of ethnicity, gender, and social class are erased, which you'll see in Galatians 3.28. And that God condemns favoritism as well in James 2.1. Black skin is not a curse, nor what did God ever say so. And the fact that it's throughout the Mor- Book of Mormon is, is very horrific, honestly. So number four, the Book of Mormon teaches that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Second Nephi 25, 23, and then also Moroni 10, 32. In contrast, of course, the Bible teaches that apart from Christ, we are dead in sin, Ephesians 2, 1, and also 5, and we're unable to do anything to merit forgiveness and eternal life. Salvation is holy of grace, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Romans 11, verse 6, Titus 3, 5 through 6. Good works are a result, not the basis of a right relationship with God, which you'll see in Ephesians 2, 10. So read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and 10. Oftentimes, we'll leave off that 10th verse, but it's very important. In fact, I'm going to read it. And I know some of it by heart, so I'm just going to start while I'm finding it. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I love that. It brings us into a right relationship with God. Number five, according to the Book of Mormon, about 600 years before Christ, a Nephite prophet predicted that many plain and precious parts, 1 Nephi 13, 26 through 28. Ooh, you read that over and over and over and over and over. It's not just those verses. Um, but it says that the many plain and precious parts would be removed from the Bible. In contrast to this, from the Bible, it is clear that during his earthly ministry, Jesus himself constantly quoted from the Old Testament scriptures, and he showed full confidence in their completeness and accurate transmission as they had survived down to his time. Jesus declared that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away in Mark 13, 31, and also Matthew 5, 18. And promised his disciples who were to pen the New Testament that the Holy Ghost shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14, 26. Jesus further promised the apostles that they would bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain in John 15, 16. These promises clearly imply that the fruit of the apostles, the New Testament scriptures, and the Christian church would endure. Number six, according to the Book of Mormon prophecy in Helaman 1427, at the time of Christ's crucifixion, darkness should cover the face of the whole earth for the space of three days. In contrast, the New Testament gospel accounts declare repeatedly that there was darkness for only three hours while Jesus was on the cross. Matthew 27, 45, Mark 15, 33, and Luke 23, 44. Expanding a little further on this, an earlier prophecy in 1 Nephi 19, 10 implies that three days of darkness will be more than region and scope For it says, this sign will be unto those who inhabit the isles of the sea, more especially given unto those who are out of the house of Israel. The darkness then would extend over the ocean to the islands and reach as far as Israel in the Middle East. The Book of Mormon references to the fulfillment of this prophecy, however, use in wording that could be understood to mean the three days of darkness was only in the Americas 
stating that the three days of darkness would be over the face of the land. Third Nephi 8, 3, and then also 10, 9. This appears to be the position of the late Mormon general authority, B.H. Roberts, in his book, Studies of the Book of Mormon, page 292. But if this is the case, then this would resolve the apparent contradiction between the Bible and the Book of Mormon regarding what happened at the time of Christ's death. For we would have had three hours of darkness in Israel and three days of darkness on the American continents. However, this would make the earlier prophecies of 1st Nephi and Helaman internally contradictory with later Book of Mormon references, since their phrasing of the Isles of the Sea, those who are of the house of Israel, and the whole face of the whole earth is difficult to understand as merely a localized time of darkness. So that one's very interesting, and I agree. Um, You really have to look into that one. But moving on to number seven. The Book of Mormon people are said to have observed all things according to the law of Moses, 2 Nephi 5.10, and also 25 verse 24. However, although they're supposed to have been Hebrews, they were descendants of the tribe of Joseph. Find this in 1 Nephi 5.17 or Manasseh in Alma 10.3. Not the tribe of Levi and the family line of Aaron as the law of Moses dictates, as you will see in Numbers 3.10, Exodus 29.9, and Numbers 18.1-7. So they would not have had the legitimate priesthood. Isn't that interesting? I found that point very interesting and really a big important one. So look into that. And then number eight, according to the Book of Mormon, there were many high priests serving at the same time. You'll see this in Mosiah 11.11, Alma 13, 9 through 10, Alma 46, verses 6, and also 38, and Helaman 325. In the New World, among those it describes as Jewish immigrants from ancient Israel who kept the law of Moses. For example, 2 Nephi 25, 10, Jacob 4, 5, and Jerome 1, 5. In contrast, It is clear from the Bible that only one individual at a time occupied the office of high priest under the Old Testament dispensation. See, for example, Leviticus 21.10, Matthew 26.3, or Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. Also, I wanted to note this before moving on to the next point. The mention in Luke 3.2 of Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests is not a real exception. In Christ's time, Israel was under the domination of the Romans who intervened to change the high priest at will. That is, this office became a kind of political football rather than following the appointment process dictated in the law of Moses. See John 18, 13, which describes Annas as father-in-law to Caiaphas who was the high priest that same year. So again, not an exception. You can see clearly that what was happening was the domination of the Romans and what had happened there. So a good one to look into and just to know the details on. Number nine, the people described in the Book of Mormon operated multiple temples. You'll see this in Alma 16, 13, 23 verse two and 26 verse 29. This violates the dictates of the Old Testament scriptures on two counts. First of all, God commanded Israel to build only one temple to reflect the fact that there is only one true God. I want you to look up Deuteronomy 12.5, also Deuteronomy 13 and 14, the full chapters, and Deuteronomy 16, 5 through 6. Um, Second, one legitimate temple was to be built in Jerusalem, Zion the location designated by God. The Old Testament is filled with explicit references to God choosing Jerusalem, Zion, as the place where his name would dwell in the temple. I am going to go ahead and list all of the references that I've mentioned and not read below. I'll copy and paste the Bible verses so that you can see exactly what they say. So check out the description below. It's just too much to read and too time consuming when making the video. But I do want you to see what the scriptures have to say. So I will list them for you. Number 10, 
the most common biblical terms used to describe the Old Testament priesthood, temple, and appointed feasts are entirely missing from the Book of Mormon. Here are 10 examples of such biblical terms and their frequencies that never appear one single time in the Book of Mormon. I found this extremely interesting and I think it's very important. So let's let's talk about it. Laver, 13 times in the Bible. Incense, 121 times in the Bible. The Ark of the Covenant, 48 times in the Bible. Huge importance. Sons of Aaron, 97 times mentioned in the Bible. The mercy seat, you'll read this 23 times in the Bible. The day of atonement, 21 times in the Bible. The feast of tabernacles, mentioned 17 times. The Passover, mentioned 59 times. The house of the Lord, 627 times in the Bible. Do you think that was of great importance? Absolutely. Why would they call it the house of the Lord 627 times? And then also Aaron. This name appears 48 times in the Book of Mormon, but it is never once in reference to the biblical Aaron or the Aaronic priesthood. Very interesting, isn't it? So um, the conclusion drawn, and I, I like how this is written out, so I want to read it. The contradictions between the Book of Mormon and the Bible constitute a most serious obstacle to accepting the Book of Mormon as latter-day scripture that is supplemental to the Bible. The Bible came first, not the Book of Mormon. And whereas the Bible is organically linked to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ by extensive surviving manuscript evidence going back as far as A.D. 125 through 30. The Book of Mormon is wholly lacking in any such evidences of ancient origin. Is it not reasonable, therefore, to make the Bible the standard for judging the Book of Mormon and not the other way around? If we accept the Bible as our measuring stick for spiritual truth, the Book of Mormon must be rejected. I thought this was an excellent article. I'm going to link it below so you can check it out and have all the references at hand. I think this is an incredibly important topic. And like I said at the beginning, I listed just 10 contradictions between the Book of Mormon and the Bible, but there are literal hundreds. So I think this is very important. I think it's an excellent topic to look into and really be aware of and um, have answers for in witnessing to Mormons and also as a Mormon. Um, I think you need to know, obviously, what the contradictions are between two things that you claim as scripture. So thank you so much for watching this video. If you like my videos, I just encourage you to subscribe. I love you to all my current subscribers. Thank you so much. I'm so thankful for your support and that you want to keep watching my videos. It means a lot to me. Send topics my way. Email me uh, that you think are applicable to my channel. I always love hearing from you. And any of those of you who are searching, email me. I always post my email in the description of every one of my videos. I would love to hear from you. And I would love to help you on your journey of seeking truth. Um, I am a born-again Christian, saved by the grace and blood of Jesus Christ. And he was resurrected after the cross. He is alive. He is real and so evident in my life and the life of born again Christians. And I want that for you. So reach out to me. Let me help you in your quest for truth. Let me help you find a solid Bible believing church. Let me help you in working out your faith and understanding that there are major issues within the belief system of Mormonism, but there is absolute truth to be found within the belief system of biblical Christianity. So reach out to me and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Thanks for watching.